So we haven't forgotten, we did have a competition running, uh, started with our season preview to give away a home or away new Villa shirt made by Kappa. Um, we have picked a winner, it's of course a, a YouTube comment, so it's uh, Liam Z Bear. Um, get in touch with us and we'll give you a new home or away shirt. Not the ones that are behind us, I wore that one to Everton, so it's covered in sweat, unless you want it, unless that's your thing. But yeah, we'll, we'll sort you out with a new shirt. Thank you so much for your support. You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Rowenson. Today, filling in for James Rushton, who's off work. I'm joined by John Townley and Pat Rowe today. Gents, how are we this morning? John, start with you. Yeah, we're good. Thanks, Dan. Been a very good weekend. I'm still smiling after it, to be honest. I don't think I'm going to be talking about it uh, the whole week, I reckon. Yeah, you said before we started, you got a bit of a sore throat, so I imagine your voice has gone... A little bit, but we'll, I'm sure we'll get past that in this next yeah, uh, this next 40 minutes or so. The sun is pretty much shining here. I've got my coffee. I've got my, my lovely white away kit on, and Aston Villa beat Man United, Old Trafford, and, and everything feels lovely in the world, doesn't it? All of a sudden, yeah. Um, I would say unexpected, but I think we've gone there a couple of times now, haven't we? I think Smith said after the after the game that we've gone toe to toe with United over the last couple of seasons. Um, so it's nice to finally get that sort of monkey off the back, and you know, finally claim three points over them. You know, we haven't. We haven't fared too well over over the last what like forty years against United. So um, yeah, no brilliant win, and the way we did it as well. The, you know the kind of circumstances to the last minute penalty, last minute goal for us as well. We sort of sort of did United um, t- almost like a taste of their own medicine as well. So that made it even sweeter. Yeah, when the goal went in, I was thinking, oh, I set obviously celebrated when I when I, when I saw about it. I was just think, oh, I'm just waiting for VAR to to come in and step in and do yeah. something. And obviously, Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer after the game moaning about Watkins offside, which I'm sure we'll touch on at some point. So I was I was waiting for something to get involved, and then when they get the penalty, oh, here we go, it was a classic last minute penalty, one or this is absolute peak Villa, peak Man United is. For Fernandez to step up, and I think the commentators were saying that he's got a ninety-five percent success rate of penalties or something like that. I don't think he's ever he's ever put one off target uh, completely. For him to step up and, and sky into the the upper tier at Old Trafford was just I mentioned it on the last podcast. The reason we keep bringing it up is just, it's just funny, isn't it? <laughs> it's that that isn't Man United, that isn't Bruno Fernandez. It's, it doesn't happen to Aston Villa things like that to go there and nick the the last minute goal and. How absolute carnage, and they miss a penalty. That just makes it all the more sweeter for me. Yeah, I was the same. It's to be fair, it's been coming. I think. I think I'm glad it happened. Obviously, because we beat them, but I'm glad it happened for Smith as well. If that kind of makes sense. Well, like against Chelsea, I think we deserved a result. Again, in the cup, I think we deserved a re- result. And the only thing that was missing was like a bit of luck. Like you just need a little something to fall to you in the box or something. And I think this bit of luck is like exactly what we needed. And it is hard for Villa to be honest. But yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Took at the uh, the team that played. Then we did a predicted eleven, and when we spoke after Chelsea and before Man United, and, and Ash predicted the team bang on. I've just flashed a graphic up on the screen there. We all know it by now. The three at the back from the eye test, it seems to be that McGinn is playing better than ever. Louise is playing is some of his best football for us as well. The three at the back really seems to suit the defence. Uh, Matty Cash looks an inspired player this season. Look, looks better than ever as well. We found a way to get Watkins and Ings playing together, but they're the two that aren't clicking in that system for me just yet. Now, I don't know whether we just put that down to you know forming a relationship together, building match fitness. I mean, Danny Ings has obviously got got a half decent record already, scoring a couple of goals for us. I think Watkins yet to, Watkins yet to get off the mark. That's the one. I don't want to turn this into a negative, but that's the one area of concern that you've got two big name, big money strikers up there that, that aren't quite gelling just yet. But the three at the back generally seems to be a, a big win for Villa, doesn't it? Yeah, I think as well the likes of Emi Buendia, maybe Leon Bailey too. I'm not too sure where they fit in and fit mm. into the system just yet because I'm sure when they're joining the club, they're probably thinking we're playing either side of a of a number ten or behind a Danny Ings, and this system might not particularly suit their set of capabilities but if if you know if Villa are getting results then they can't and um, you know can't can't complain but now I'm interested in seeing how that sort of dynamic works out um when Emmy Buendia and when Leon Bailey are both firing um how Smith gonna incorporate those two um whether you go for like a four triple two um and have them either side of a of a two up front with uh, Ings and Watkins but defensively we're, we're sound you know you got Ming, uh, McGinn and Douglas Lewis and the shackles are almost off them now whereas beforehand they were mm. always in that duo um, in front of the defence you know screening and allowing wingers El Ghazi and uh, Traore um, last season and a number 10 and the striker to kind of do their thing and they were just mopping up but now they're allowed to kind of have time on the ball which they're you know 
we haven't really seen those two, at least in the Villa shirt, doing that because we know for Scotland, McGinn's always getting goals. Yeah, Douglas Luiz is playing in the midfield for Brazil. You know, these are two really good midfielders, and we're not we haven't really made use of them up until um, at least the start of this season. So that's you know exciting to see. Um, but no, I just think the dynamic between your Leon Bailey's and Yemi Buendia's, yeah, they can come off the bench, but when you, how much is that like sixty five million almost um, sitting on your substitutes bench? That can be a good thing, but at the same time, you know. You've got to make use of them over the course of the season too. So I think it's just allowing the players to have the freedom to do what they want to do. So like before, with a four at the back or in a four-two-three-one, I think with McGinn's got a large defensive responsibility, so has Douglas Louise. But this back three, just how solid it is, whether it's Hawes or Twan Zibi with Kanza or Mings, they're just like launching themselves into anything that comes through. The ball's over the top, they're fast enough to deal with. I just feel like it works really well and allows... Like Matty Cash can get more involved going forward now. I think he had the second most touches on, on the ball against United, and he was he could have got an assist for target. He's already equaled his goal involvements from last season. I think that is just the testament to how much more involved he is in this team in this formation. But yeah, it is another. The issue is how do you get your best players in, which are like Buendia and Bailey when they come in. <clears throat> but it allows you the freedom to do it and like freedom to have options to change in game. If that makes sense. Like I said, I don't want to turn a, a victory against May United into into a negative, and obviously we scored three against Everton without Ings and Watkins scoring there either. But you do look at that strike force. I think there's 30, 35 goals there, and for them not to be scoring together in, in a system that is having success, kind of part of me kind of feels like well that will come at some point if Villa are playing well, those two will score goals together at some point in the same side. Um, is there such thing? as a best 11 anymore and a, and a best side and, and best players. Because we talk about how oh, you've got to get your best 11 together, got to get Buendir in there, got to get Bailey. Like I, said, just, like I just said, if, if you're getting results without them, you've got this squad that's much stronger than we've, than we've seen in the Premier League since we've been back up here. That Maybe you don't need to get them all in together. They all play their part over the course of a season. I think having that capability to, to chop and change, it causes headaches for other managers as well because we're probably not going to set up with a a three at the back against Norwich or at least we might but it'll be a completely different system or at least how we're playing that mm. compared to a Man United away um, but you say yeah, that we go to Man United away and play attacking football though it's not like we've played a three at the back it's a defensive three at the back yeah exactly and you have players um, some players doing man marking on Pogba I think Mings was always looking to um, nip the ball off Pogba when he could but against a team like a Norwich at home, or, you know, no disrespect to them, like a Watford at home either, because they've obviously said they're beaters at the start of the season. But you're playing different sort of ways, you're playing different systems, um, and there's different matchups on the fi- on the field as well. So I don't think there's a, such thing as a best eleven. Um, but I think having that adaptability throughout the season, that's only going to serve you well um, throughout the campaign. But no, uh, go on, Pat. Yeah, it's just a good problem to have, isn't it? I feel like. It- in recent seasons, especially in the Premier League, it was just, OK, it's got to 60 minutes, let's sub Trezeguet on for El Ghazi. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> everyone moans and it would rarely change a game. I mean, there are like situations where they have done it, but to have the option to just do what you want and like it. Like against Everton, it was Smith like, identified that that target was constantly in space. So he was like, OK, target's not really doing the job of a left back. No one's marking him. I'm just going to put Leon Bailey as a left wing back because he doesn't have to do the defensive role. Because yeah. we're just sitting back, and then Leon Bailey comes on and gets an assist and gets a goal. So it's that kind of like swapping and changing where he doesn't need to play all his cards at once in the starting eleven and can just see how the game unfolds. Well, you'd also like to think that will keep us fresher and that we don't have what we had last season. Where I know that was down to Jack Grealish's injury, but what we don't fall off in the second half of the season because we've had a, a rotated squad and people are coming in, doing a job, going out again, and everyone stays a, a bit more fresh. Smith's had the, the doesn't make good substitutions thing levelled at him for a couple of seasons now and he you know, doesn't have good game management or doesn't set things up right. And we're now starting to see that yeah, maybe that was true in, in seasons gone by, but that's not that Dean Smith isn't a good t- tactician or, or doesn't know what he's doing. It's that maybe he's just not had the tools to do what he wants to do. And this is now that we're seeing that he's built a squad. And I say we've built a squad, we've still got to you know, kick on and keep pushing forward. And I'm, I'm sure we're not quite there yet. But he's now got options where he can change a game. Whereas like you just said, Pat, bringing on Trezeguet or bringing on El Ghazi for, for 15 minutes or bringing on Wesley for 15 minutes. In hindsight, was that really going to change a game? Probably not. Bringing on somebody like Leon Bailey is going to change a game. We well, almost did it against United as well. Like, I think Buendia <laughs> came on, played 13 minutes, and uh, he had that little, like, I don't know what he did with his feet. But, like, like stream was a bit dodgy, couldn't, couldn't actually see. <laughs> but we like, chopped it onto one, and then it just opened up the play for Ramsey. And obviously, Ramsey slipped. But if Ramsey slots that in the bottom corner, 
when Diaz got an assist and yeah, true. the substitute has changed the game and beaten United away. Like obviously we have, but it probably gets overlooked that that could have changed the game as well. But on another day, it does. Well, we'll mention Grealish briefly, but I don't want to. I don't want to touch him too much because again, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of bored of the whole thing. But we kind of said when when he left, there's an opportunity here for Villa to be better without him, and that probably raised a few eyebrows. Maybe not amongst the Villa community, but amongst the wider football community, that you lose a player of that quality who's clearly worth a massive fee. How can you be better off the back of that? But we were a one man team, weren't we? We were very. It's very easy to go right, give the ball to Jack, he'll do something. We've now built a team, and people say that we were a one man team last year. But we weren't even a team, were we? It was, it was literally Grealish or nothing. We are a team now in, in every sense of the word. And you look across that whole squad, the start of 11 and, and the sub come on and help change the game. And we, I mean, it's early days yet, of course. I'm not going to start saying we were suddenly better after six games because you know, we started the season poorly, didn't we, against Watford. But the theory suggests that we are now a better team without him. And I prefer that. I'm probably going to have people saying I'm bitter, maybe, for that you know, not over Grealish going and all that kind of thing. But it does seem we're a better team, a better squad, a better unit without him. Again, that's bang on, Dan. I think if you almost look in comparison, I think, Pat, you did a piece earlier about the difference in Harry Kane and Grealish. One of them moves for 100 million and Villa reinvests that money really well. The other one stays, maybe not wanting to be there. And then there's yeah. a, you know, a massive problem there. Um, I think last season I was a bit not necessarily frustrated or annoyed that we were called a one-man team but I think when because we knew how good Jack Grealish is and he's like shining in a Man City team full of you know global stars that we get in any team so that kind of proves of what sort of player we had um, so to be called a one-man team it was like well yeah we are because Jack is that good um, yeah that's fair so I don't th- you know, there was that wasn't putting any of any of our any of our players down. But I think from the outside, most people probably viewed that as a Grealish is by far their best player. Therefore, Ezri Concha isn't good enough to play for England, and John McGinn isn't that great, and you know Douglas Louise can't play as a number six. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But in reality, now it's just an opportunity for these lads to um to step up to the fold, and we as Villa fans knew that they had the capability to do that. But I think from the outside, it just looked like everything was going for Grealish, which yes, it was. But let's put that in context and. You know, Jack Grealish is one of the best players in Europe right now. So, you know, of course we're going to be a one-man team. Most teams would be a one-man team with Jack Grealish in, in their um, in their starting eleven. You know, even if you're excluding top four clubs, that's probably every team. So, mm. it's no sort of embarrassment to be like that. But obviously, this season, I think you're right. We are a much better um, squad, much much more um, tighter as a as a unit on the pitch um, and off it maybe as well because everyone knows that they can contribute over the season now and get their sort of um, plaudits from every other game because everyone's involved. You know, Matty Cash is shining now on that right side, like Grealish was on the left, and that you know you wouldn't have thought that would be the case um, at least during pre-season. So, no, I think it's um, we've improved massively, and that's a big testament to the recruitment team, but also that we know Dean Smith's improved. You know, so many of our players already. Pat, who do you who are you most impressed by this season? Who do you think stepped up the most in, in Grealish's absence? <laughs> I would say Matty Cash. To be honest, it's just been a rev- revelation, hasn't it? So increased touches, the way he gets forward. He's obviously scored his first Premier League goal. It's just like nice to see that, like like previous, like last season, you'd see Grealish not on the team sheet, and you like be a bit disheartened, and you're just like, oh, we've got no chance because you were just plugging someone like El Ghazi, which isn't up to the standard of Grealish in the same position, and asking mm. him to do the same role. Whereas this season, you've just got so many options to go into games, different systems, different for like different players playing in different positions, and it's just exciting for fans to not know where goals are going to come from, not because of a creativity issue, but because anyone can go and get the goal that can change the yeah. game type thing. So it's just quite an exciting time to be a Villa fan, I think. John, talk to me about your namesake, John McGinn. He looks so much more improved than, than last season, doesn't he, already? And, I, and the question I'll just ask you, Pat, there, my answer would be John McGinn. You know, obviously, him and Grealish were, were good mates off the field. He seems to have really stepped up this season in terms of responsibility, now vice-captain, of course, as well, and just kind of taking the game to the opposition and, and John McGinn doing John McGinn things in games. He's a bloody good footballer, isn't he? I think there's different sort of factors well, that we can kind of go into is why John McGinn is now performing at the level that we know that he could. Um, mm. I think when he was in the championship, he was he was ripping it up. He was one of the best players in the league. And, you know, that's um, no disrespect to the championship, but John McGinn's a much better footballer than that level. And obviously he comes in and starts getting loads of different goal contributions and really performing well. And then obviously gets his injury. Um, and since then, or at least in, uh, the last season, um, and Project Restart 2, he was rushed back and he wasn't, by his own admission, he wasn't fit enough. Um, and that injury was quite 
more, much more severe than what fans probably thought at the time. Um, he was almost seen as like, oh, can you be the saver and f- saver in Project Restart? And he obviously wasn't fit enough, and that's going into the next season too. Um, didn't have the best pre-season. And it all sort of um, accumulated into this play that wasn't necessarily playing his best football, but we knew that there was a player in there. And I think in pre-season, um, McGinn said himself, he's um, kind of quit the deliveries and the tenants and he's got personal trainers now and he's, he's, he's much more fit than what he's been before. You can tell he's much more leaner. Um, and I think as well in Scotland during the Euros, uh, I think he was given almost like a, not necessarily a captain, but a captain's role um, in the squad. And he is almost sort of realising now that he's, He's not necessarily an experienced pro, but amongst the Villa squad he is, because we obviously last season had the, the youngest um, average 11. And John McGinn now being a vice-captain, he's got the responsibility and I think that helps him, almost like what it did with Grealish. Um, mm. Sort of lets that player know that, you know, you are one of the best players we have here. Um, make use of it because, you know, a footballer's career doesn't last too long. Um, and I think for John McGinn, the level that he can reach, I think he's realising now he's got, what, five, six years more um, at the top. So let's sort of make use of it every game. And um, if anyone's going to do that, it's McGinn because we know how sort of aggressive he is. How you know he's got so much tenacity as well when he's playing. Um, so yeah, you know we've got John McGinn back is what I would probably say. Kind of makes you question to a certain extent why footballer is on the delivery orders and the tenants. But we'll let that slide because he's John McGinn. <laughs> but having said all that, Pat, from a stats perspective, he's not really shining, is he? I don't know why that yeah. is. It maybe it means that we shouldn't read into stats too much, but the numbers don't really back up the eye test that he looks way better this season. Well, this might ruin my career, but yeah, the stats aren't reflecting <laughs> what, he, <laughs> what he's doing, really. Obviously, I, I am one for stats, but um, he was one of the worst rated, like on the website, he was one of the worst rated players on the pitch against United, but I thought, like from actually watching it, that he was one of our best. I don't think like, the stats will really reflect it as much. Like the tenacity he shows in midfield, like breaking play up, knocking the ball past Maguire, which should have been a foul and at least yeah. a book in. Just things like that that go unnoticed in a performance that you you have to look at and recognise. But yeah, he was for me, he was our player of the month last season. And in the Brentford game, when he didn't play, he was missed. And uh, I was glad that he started this game because I thought we were going to struggle if he didn't uh, make it due to the concussion he had the other day. But yeah, I think he's back to his best 100% this season. And it was partly because of just the system we're playing and the, uh, the uh, reinforcements we've had defensively and everything. Just He's excelling in this system, I think. The flip side of that, a player that is backed up by the stats, Courtney Hawes. I've held my hands up on a couple of podcasts now. I don't want to keep mentioning it because I want to keep throwing myself under the bus. But for people that don't watch every single video, a couple of weeks ago, I said I didn't quite fancy him against Ronaldo. And he pockets Lukaku and Ronaldo in consecutive games. And I hold my hands up and say, yeah, fair enough. Right, we move on. I've, I've made that point several times now. His stats show that he had a great game. Obviously scores the winner, gives away the penalty, but missed anyway. So, you know, that's still funny. Um, and he keeps his side, plays in the side, doesn't he? You got Twan Zabi comes in. And re- again, I don't want to touch on it too much. The reason why I wasn't with Hall so much is because on paper, he's fourth choice, isn't he? Twan Zabi comes in as your reinforcement centre-back. We don't expect us to be playing three at the back. So you think it's Ming's concert, Twan Zabi third, and Hall's all the way down to fourth. His contract's running out and you think, oh, well, maybe he's, he's not here to stick around then. All of a sudden, we play three at the back. Hawes comes in for a cup game, fills in for Twan Zabi because he can't play against his parent club and all of a sudden he's undroppable. It is difficult to choose between them, isn't it? But it's, again, a very good problem to have. <clears throat> he's in the player that's just developed like tenfold under Smith and in this game, yeah, he just always looks so assured now this season and physically, like, he just dominates players. He's got the pace. He's, I'm comfortable with him on the ball, I think. I highlighted that I might not be comfortable with the Mings and him, like, in a back three because they're both so left-footed. But I don't think I had any moments of like, ooh, like panic at all. <laughs> no, I'm fine with it, yeah. So him and Twanzi with the battle for that last centre-back place, if they're playing in a back three, it's completely fine with me. But yeah, I think Lukaku and then Ronaldo, and I think Harry Kane's next. So yeah, which pocket? Yeah, I agree. And I think as well, Horst gets, I don't know, like I feel like in the Championship, when we're on in that 10-match winning run as well, people sort of overlook the, how much House played in that as well. I think he played mm. six of the 10 yeah, games. Fair. Um and uh, Tuan Zebe, or was it Tuan Zebe was the one who dropped out through injury? Um, and to kind of keep that um, that partnership going, obviously played with Mings. Um, but I think he played on the right side as well, which you know, stylistically, you would have thought of that that's a, sort of the weaker side. Um, obviously, being a left footer, um, and he didn't look out of place. I think he scored against Nottingham Forest too, and you know, he's part of um, a solid team there. I think his debut was against Stoke. He probably didn't play his best game. I think he got quite a lot of criticism already off the bat, probably because... It was Wigan, wasn't it, I think, his debut. Was it Wigan? Yeah, and um, 
I think there's quite a lot of scepticism over it because Villa back and obviously we're nowhere near the playoffs. But then mm. to kind of come in and form that partnership and, and do what he's done ever since, it's, you know, full credit to him. And he was only like seven, I say only seven years ago, but back when he was um, under 21, he was playing in like the Toulon tournaments and winning with England and the Gareth Southgate, who was obviously there at Old Trafford as well. I'm not kind of bigging him up for a call up just yet, but it's quite nice just to see a player sort of get back in the saddle sort of thing. So he's had a couple of couple of years at Wol- uh, Wolves and not really cementing himself there and then obviously leaves for Villa and that he struggled um, really to sort of pin down that first team place but to see a player that sort of makes full use of that um, makes use of the opportunity that's you know that's exactly what you want and I think that's credit to Dane Smith and the sort of culture that we've got now at the club no one's mm. sort of sulking on the bench it's as soon as I come in I've got to you know make use of um, make use of the opportunity and make sure that um, I'm winning that shirt every the weekend now. Yeah, and how many times in seasons gone past have we seen that that someone comes in and gets a chance in the, in the absence of an injury or a suspension and you think, they did nothing there. Or, yeah. they've, they've done absolutely nothing to suggest that they should be playing next game. If you come in, you've got to take a chance. Mm-hmm. If, if Wendy exactly. comes in and doesn't do anything, he's out. Bailey comes in. If he, come, if he comes in and doesn't do anything, you've got Traore. Traore was, was a, a good performer last year. He was, he was a starter for the most part. And this season, he's barely kicked a ball. That's a dangerous player to have on the bench when, when you've got tired legs after, after 60, 70 minutes. All kind of signs are pointing towards Villa building a better side. And how many times do we look at other clubs when we're playing against them and look at their bench and think, "Cross, yeah, you know, if we if Villa are, are doing well here for sixty five minutes, they could bring on him there and they change yeah. the game." And you look at our bench, you think, well, "We've got Keenan Davis to come on." It's, it's different yeah. levels, isn't it? We, we finally look like we've got a proper Premier League squad now. And that, that was only a year ago or two years ago that I was when, when we got promoted. You'd, you'd, when we played at Everton, who were in and around that top six conversation and and other clubs um, in and around the European spots. Even Wolves, for example, have only been in the Premier League for like one year when we got promoted. And you look at their bench and you thought, wow, we've got, there's a massive, massive um, gap that we have to make up in, you know, what, six, seven, five, six, seven years. Um, and we've seemed to have just done it almost in two years. Um, and I think for this sort of club that we are, it's 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 not necessarily a hard sell um, to recruit players mm-hmm. to say, you know, yeah, you won't be guaranteed a space, a, a you know, position every week. For example, Morgan Sanson when he joined from Marseille, you know, that's that's a massive club in France, and then he's still willing yeah. to join the club, um, just to try and fight that, fight for that place because he believes that he's got the ability to do so, and they're not going to kick up a fuss because again, it's that culture, um, you know, it's it's a real squad um, that we've got now, and on uh, body more here, I'm sure it's a really good atmosphere, and, and you know, we're all driving towards that one goal of getting European football, and you know, every player, whether you're on the bench. Every youth player as well playing in the first team training, um, or you're playing now on every week. You know everyone's got the same goal, and there's no, no sort of um, fusses made. Let's talk about Emmy Martinez, another key component of that defence being improved over the last season and, and this season as well. Um, another one that sets kind of the tone for the, for the recruitment. You know, good personality, clearly, clearly a winner wants to win. Um, mind game, expert, just. Unreal. Got to be up there as one of the best signings in the Premier League in recent seasons. Up there as one of the best goalkeepers in the league this season. Against Man United, I know they've had loads of shots in that game, but nothing really that's troubled him. But when he is called upon, he's there to, to race out and blast away a, a potential chance. Um, the penalty antics, yeah, he's not had to physically save the penalty, but he's there to, to all that stuff about pointing to Ronaldo and saying, go on, mate, you take it, you take it. I'm not, I assume that's what the conversations are, maybe with a few more uh, expletives in there, but saying, you know, I don't fancy you, Bruno, you, Ronaldo, you should be taking this. And I'll just, I'm sure you'd have done the same thing, vice versa, if, if Ronaldo was due to take it. And then dancing in front of the wife at the uh, the home end just after after Bruno missed it. Just little things like that. I mentioned it to Ash. It's, you know, you want your footballers to be good at football for, first and foremost, but the little, little things that make them have a good personality and will wind up the opposition. We've missed that for a few years, and I, I like having that in the squad. And, and you know, like I said, he is good at football as well. I didn't know he had that side to him, to be honest. Like, no, I didn't. Have season, I thought, yeah, I thought he was just a nice guy. He kept quiet, and then he went to the Cup of America, and he's telling Yerry Mina he's going to eat him alive. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> it's a bit of a shock to the system. But um, yeah, I think he had a busy summer, obviously, with the Cup of America, and he didn't do much wrong in the Watford game. But that was probably one chance he could have saved. Remember the first, like last season, if he's sharp, he saves it. And then against Newcastle, I think he rushed out and it was offside, but he gave away a penalty. And it was just stuff like that that just maybe hinted that he wasn't up to his like match sharpness that we used to see him. Because he's so consistent when he is on form, as we saw last season. Yeah. And this one, I think it just once again, it's just the confidence he instills like in the fans and the players around him is just like massive. 
like the save for Maguire. He didn't just palm it like he didn't just save it. He palmed it away from danger as well. And it's every single thing that I think they had four shots on target out of twenty eight shots. Every single one I was just comfortable with him making, claiming the ball, rushing. He was quick off his line as well. I thought there was a few times yeah. they got they got in behind and he was quite quick off the line and I was relieved of that. Of that. But yeah, really strong showing. We definitely have one of the best keepers in the league. Yeah, that, that quick off the line thing is maybe what would have saved Toro Ming's error the, a few weeks ago, yeah. wouldn't it? You know, the, yeah. if buts and maybes, whether he was playing oversteer, but you know, that's a game past and we won't mention it. Um, John, what well, goalkeeper? Is he up there as one of the best in the league? You've got Edison and Allison with Man City and Liverpool, but Martinez has got to be up there in the top three yeah. or four, surely. Yeah, he has to be. I think the way that opposition fans view him as well, I think over the past couple of years, there's been quite a few Villa players that we've rated. Um, but I think a lot of opposition fans sort of bat it off as, oh, it's just Villa fans, you know, trying to big up the players. But Emi Martinez, I think everyone just loves. Um, apart from I, I think the opposite. I think the opposite. I've seen a few tweets in the last day or so that I saw a tweet. Somebody put like, "Who's your, who's your favourite footballer who doesn't play for your club, and who's your least favourite?" And a lot of the least favourite replies from neutral fans was Emi Martinez, just because oh, they know, I think they know he's a bit of a wind-up. This is after Man United. Oh, yeah, and they yeah. weren't all Man United fans because now I think seeing things like that on match of the day, realizing he's a bit of a wind-up merchant and thinking like <laughs> he would wind me up as a supporter. And likewise, yeah, yeah, yeah. the other way around, I remember talking about this about Henry Lansby when we signed him in the Championship a few years ago. When he's playing against you, you hate that kind of player. He'll wind you up, he'll, oh, yeah. he'll nick everything. That's what Emi Martinez is like. If we were playing against him and he was saving everything and then dancing in front of me at Villa Park, I'd absolutely despise <laughs> yeah. him. But having that on your side is that little bit of bite that winds up the fans, winds up the opposition, gets in their faces to make them score a penalty in the last minute. That's the play that you want in your team. That's what Villa yeah. fans are gloating about it. But you know, if you look at just his goalkeeping ability, he is one of the best in the Premier League. And if he's one of the best in the Premier League, he must be one of the best in Europe. Um, yeah. And that's not an exaggeration in my opinion. The way he's just gone into Argentina and just claimed the number one spot over like two games and obviously done his heroics in the Copa America. Leo Messi calling him like a phenomenon and all sorts, you know, We've got a proper goalkeeper there and one of the best that we might have ever had. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, I know we're all obviously a bit a bit younger than, than maybe some fans that have seen, you know, people like Nigel Spink and, and, and Bosnich yeah. and people like that. I'd always have had, if I was doing like a best 11 in my lifetime, I'd always have put Friedel as my goalkeeper yeah. during yeah. the, the O'Neill era. I think I'd be picking Martinez now as the best keeper in my lifetime. I, I, and again, I know things have changed since you know 2006 when there wasn't social media, but knowing, I feel like I know Amy Martinez more than I know what yeah. Brad Friedel is like as a personality. So I would think if I was picking a favourite 11 now, Martinez takes my top spot as a goalkeeper in the past 25 years or so for me. Yeah, I'm the same. I feel like when Friedel was there, and was, actually the side was really good. I was quite young, was young like old enough to know what was going on, but maybe not old enough to like appreciate how good he was. So mm-hmm. I'm not really sure how good he was. But yeah, seeing Martinez, it's just, I think last season he prevented seven goals. But and like those are games where he makes the difference. If that makes sense, I feel like in this game he made the difference as well. And these are games where you win points and it follows Villa at the table. So yeah, and his international. Like achievements in the summer just outline it for me I think he is the best I've seen signing him for 20 million and I'm not suggesting this is a we want to sell Amy Martinez because we absolutely don't but what is he worth now? decent age as well for a goalie um, 29 yeah. Martinez so he's got, <laughs> yeah, yeah he's got years and years ahead um, again it's that it's it's the sign of he's worth whatever Villa value, at, value him at Um mm. Not to go back to Grealish too much, but at the end, Grealish probably doesn't go for 100 million um, if it wasn't for that release clause. So you're probably looking at, you know, 30, 20, 30 million more than that, um, just because that's the price that we would command for a player that's, you know, it's it's the, it's the value that we set ultimately. But I think you're looking anywhere upwards of 50 million plus. Um, I wouldn't sell him for for at least 60 million myself, um, because if, if he's that good and people are willing to pay, pay that price, then there you go. That's the value. It doesn't matter what the historic value of the of the other players are. Um, it's whatever the club value them at and whatever clubs want to pay for. Didn't Kepa go for 70, 80 million? 72 million, um, yeah. Yeah, so again, that's probably a benchmark that Villa would look at if there was any sort of rumour um, or if, you know, I think Oblak might be leaving Atletico Madrid. That's maybe something that um, they'd be looking at uh, for valuable goalkeepers. Not that Martinez is available, but if you're looking at some of the best keepers in Europe that aren't playing for that elite club right now, Martinez is definitely um, on that list and he would be mm. command, we'd command a fee of, you know, it would be silly money, wouldn't it? 
Um, because we don't need to sell. Simple as that. Let's touch on Spurs a little bit. We'll do. We'll be doing a more in-depth preview later in the week with with somebody from the Spurs side. Hopefully, I said this against Man United in our post Chelsea chat with you, Pat. I think you were on that anyway. I just had a fancy yeah. against Man United for some reason. Oh, yeah. Absolute pure nonsense for me. Just thinking, oh, I just fancy us. I'm not basing that off anything. So we've got a terrible record, but yeah, proven to be right there for once. And I feel the same way about Spurs. Spurs yeah. have, have been strange this season. I think first three games, 1-0. Uh, won them all 1-0. And then you know the, the following three games, I think they've conceded three in every game so far in um, in September. So we'll see what, what what trend they want to set in October. Hopefully it's conceding four in every game and we start that on Sunday. But I just fancy us against them. I know that there's, it works both ways, doesn't it, with, with them being a bit of a wounded animal. They'll either come out on Sunday and absolutely blast us away and have a point to prove. Or they're still licking their wounds after Arsenal and we can go there and, and take advantage. And I'm, I'm obviously hoping it's the last. Uh, you mentioned Kane there, John. Is that the, the key to, to stopping them, making sure that Kane it still isn't firing and, and hoping that that's enough just to, to put them off the game and, and we do our job? Yeah, I wouldn't focus on Spurs. I mean, obviously, to um, to an extent, I would focus on our game and take the game to them because we know if we can go away to Man United, that's the benchmark when we yeah. can beat them. That's a team that's free scoring with, you know, obviously Ronaldo and they seem to be getting goals from anywhere, um, at least in the Premier League. Um, so if you're planning against Tottenham, we've shipped three in the last three. No, sorry, nine in the last three. Um, and only scored once against Arsenal um, in the in the latter sort of stage of the game when they were put, obviously pushing for some sort of comeback. Um, but I think no, take the game to them. I think if you if we can keep a clean sheet against Tottenham, then the odds are that you probably win the game. Um, yeah. And I think you know, even if you took a point away from Tottenham, that's not a bad result. No, of course it isn't. But you win there last season two one, um, and with the sort of confidence that we have now, we'll definitely be going there to try and turn them over. Um, hundred percent. I don't. I don't think that's a doubt. And, and I don't. I don't doubt that at all. And I think Smith, ever since we got promoted, was always looking to win at Man City, win at Man United. He was always looking to win in games. So, hundred percent, we're going there to win. Um, obviously, we have to have a game plan with that because although Tottenham have had some pretty poor results of late, that's a top team. You know, star players across the um, across the squad. So. No, I, th- I think there's areas where we can exploit them as well. The defence is particularly great. Um, obviously, as I said, considering a lot of goals in the last few games, um, Ollie Watkins and Danny Ings will run them run them into the ground, I'm sure. Um, but if we can keep it tight, I think House will probably play again, to be fair. Why drop him? Um, probably an unchanged team. I think, mm. you know, go again. I think there's every reason that we can get another three points. I think it's a good time to play them and probably a bad time for them to play us, if that makes mm. sense. It's, I feel we're full of confidence and... For me, yeah, I'm I'm always positive, but I'm more positive than usual about this one because I just feel like I fully trust the defence now. If that makes sense, so like usually the threat, Harry Kane, from memory, loves scoring a goal against. I think his one of his first like come out performances was the free kick he scored against us and stuff. But um, yeah, like I'm confident that the defence can deal with him. And as yesterday showed, I think he had a 45 percent pass accuracy and like 20 touches of the ball. And just like one shot on target. I think he's not getting involved in games. And if we can deal with that, then it's all on San and Matty Cash. I trust him to deal with San. And Target can deal with Bergwijn or Mora. And then we can pose a real threat as well. Like Ollie Watkins and Ings, although the goals aren't coming, they're occupying the centre halves and pressing them and just not, not leaving them like a moment's rest. Yeah. And it's opening space up for Louise to operate in and play these passes in and McGinn to run into. And Ramsey's got the freedom as well. So I think it's a very balanced squad and we've got threats like all over the pitch and Spurs of threats maybe are just like isolated in one of like two to three players. If you stop them, you stop Spurs as it's like it's been shown in the past few games. So yeah, I'm excited and I think we will get a result here. I love how a couple of wins does does a fry confidence. We go, yeah, so no, this, this, this elite <laughs> Premier League football. Yeah, Cash will deal with him. We just move on to the next point. Like that's a nothing conversation. Yeah, so does it. Does it we'll, we'll deal with that. Yeah, Kane just yeah. yet to score this season. So you know, Aston Villa coming up next. Absolutely nailed on that he gets his first goal of the season against that's us because those yeah. things always seem to happen. Although the flip side of that is that Watkins is yet to score this season, so he's due a goal against against uh, uh, Spurs and he's an Arsenal fan, isn't he? I think so. He'll be he'll be well up for this one. Is there anyone or anything that we've we've neglected to talk about from this excellent Man United victory? that you can think of. I think we've covered most players. Just because yeah. you mentioned Jacob Ramsey there in passing there, I thought, well, yeah, this youngster playing think, Premier League games for us and excelling and we don't even talk about him. It's a testament, isn't it? I was thinking that in the middle of the game, I thought, like, the first half against Newcastle, um, his first appearance, no, second appearance of the season, first at Villa Park. And probably Ramsey's first uh, sort of game in front of a full Villa Park as well, I thought, in the first half, the ball was kind of bouncing off him a little bit. Um, which isn't a negative because that was like a cauldron and it was really hard for him to sort of get into the game a little bit and the second half he obviously grew into it but you didn't even notice him which is a good thing against United to the extent where you didn't 
you know, he didn't really put a foot wrong. Obviously, he mm-hmm. slipped over when he had that opportunity. But apart from that, he did. He just did his uh, he did his job down to a T, and that's exactly why Dean Smith um, pushed him up from you know twenty eighteen playing against West Brom in his debut up to now playing in the Premier League at Old Trafford, starting playing in ninety minutes. He's, he might not be at the moment, at least you know, the most prettiest footballer in the world, like gliding past people like we've had before. Um, although he is capable of doing that, we know that he's a player that can do a job, and he's you know he's, he's very good at that. And he's only nineteen still, and that's kind of crazy when you think about it. If you think about all of the young players in the Premier League that everyone is sort of gravitating to and thinking, oh, you know, this player and that player, Jacob Ramsey just flown under the radar. Um, mm. Yeah, a- excellent player, and I'm, I'm sure he's buzzing about it. And his you know his family as well. Obviously, he's got two two brothers in the academy. There's obviously a you know a good brotherhood there. But no brilliant for him I'm really happy for him there's a midfield there of United that's worth over 200 million and Jacob Ramsey didn't look out of place at all yeah. he's free so, <laughs> and so yeah it's, he grows in each game of confidence I think and it didn't come now just like a slip but the goal will come or the assist the thing that just boosts his confidence like through the roof yeah. and it like, isn't already there yeah. So he's exciting and yeah, that position's his at the moment. You can't really displace him. We talked about this in a previous episode. I think it, I think it was after Man United, but me and Ash spoke about it at some point. And it's about that midfield the midfield balance. It was, a, it was the biggest talking point over the summer, wasn't it? Every kind of preview we did and, and season preview and transfer targets. It, it was always, oh, we need this midfielder. We need this big number six. We need this strong DM. You know, without them, Villa won't be able to tick properly. And, you know, it's vital that we get them. You know, we've got... We'll sign Brendan, we'll sign Bailey. Yeah, but we need this number six to, to make it all tick together. It just doesn't look like a problem anymore. And I'm not saying that Jones Will Browse at 50 million wouldn't have slotted in there nicely in Jacob Ramsey's place. And yeah, that stops his development. But obviously, he's a much higher level than Ramsey is at this point. And maybe that would fly us totally up the league. I'm, I'm not denying that. But he wasn't a number six. Do you know what I mean? Like, we, yeah. it doesn't look like we've needed that DM because we found a balance to, to play without one. And so far, so good. And like I said, I know it is early days. But Smith and the coaching staff and the recruitment team were right not to just go and think, well, yeah, Ward Proud was plan A, but rather than spend thirty million on plan C, D or E, let's trust Draco Ramsey. Let's coach Douglas so he used to play this role better. Let's coach Douglas um John McGinn to play his role better and get the best out of what we've got rather than bringing in another body for the sake of it. I agree. It's I think confidence like breeds confidence type of thing and the back three with the centre halves is doing that. Like they're just dealing with everything that's thrown at them. And then there's not as much responsibility on the likes of Douglas Louise to make that tackle, which maybe leads to a penalty and people get on his back or John McGinn to just be sitting deep and not getting forward and being the real McGinn that people want to see. So, yeah, I think the formation they've chosen for the back three is just allowing everyone to do the role they want to do and everyone's thriving and doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just working really well and, yeah. The coaching staff do know what they do. <laughs> I probably should have asked you this off air so you could have had a, had a look at the stats, Pat, but I'd, I'd like to compare the average positions of the back three compared yeah, to where a DM would yeah. sit last season. Because I feel like we've yeah. played such a such a more high, a much more higher line this season that Mings yeah. or Hawes or whoever is the you know the most central at any position in that back three is probably in a similar position to where Douglas Luiz or John McGinn were dropping back as, as a DM last season anyway. Yeah. So it almost yeah. feels like they're doing a, a DM's job between them allowing yeah. McGinn and Louise to push forward, which is ultimately what the problem was, that yeah. those players aren't cut out to sit deep. And, and we've seen the proof of that this season. From what I can remember, <laughs> looking at the positions, from, I'm not, it was a game that Twanzebe played, but Twanzebe is the deepest one out of the three. So I think Conza and Mings maybe step forward a bit and operate, like like get the interceptions, like John said, about trying to rob it from Pogba type thing. Mm. And then Douglas Weiss still sits, but I don't think he sits as deep and he does get more involved going forward. Yeah. So yeah. I think it is just like the back three is like it's reverberating throughout the team type thing, I think. And to be fair, you don't really need to play a DM with a back three DL, I suppose that's kind of the point. Um, but yeah, that, that's almost Villa's way around it, I guess, rather than, you know, they didn't get the target they want. So let's make the most out of the squad we've got. And in a way, that's 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 better, isn't it, I think? I think as well with the three, but I don't know if we probably should have expected it as well. I mean, obviously, Dane kept it under wraps in pre-season because we were playing mm. four at the back most of the time. But I'm presuming that against Watford and uh, Newcastle, we would have done the five at the back if Ollie Watkins was fit for those games because um, he probably didn't trust. In fact, did we have another striker at that time? Apart from Danny Ings, I don't think we did because obviously Kenny Davis was injured. We had no, Wesley um, yeah. at, at the time. Yeah, but I think just in general, I think that's exactly what Smith wanted throughout pre-season. We probably worked on that shape, um, you know, in, in training at Bodymore. Um, they didn't kind of want to almost like leak it, I suppose, during the pre-season games. Um, 
and obviously being linked say down with James Will Prowse, he would probably fit in perfectly in that midfield three because he can get forward and also sort of wrap around a little bit as well. Um, but the fact that we all knew that we needed that number six, it was kind of evident that Villa probably knew that as well. Mm. But to not be like properly linked with that player, we probably should have known that actually there's a reason why we're not doing that. Um, but I guess three at the back was almost out of the blue because Smith's only done that a couple of times during his managerial mm. career, I think. Um, but no, I think it's, it's a really good system to play because it's very flexible as well. You can probably change that to a four and keep pretty much the same average positions. Um, but just touching on the three at the back average positions as well, I think that's really important because Twain Zebe, you're almost playing as like a sweeper. We know he can play as a right back and he's very quick. Um, House can play as a full back as well and so can Mings. Cause, so you've almost got this... Um, almost physicality wise like stylistically we know that they can play with the ball um and obviously good defenders and they can block shots and get clearances and inceptions but going the other way if we are caught out by that high press then we know that they can get back and um get back at really good speed as well just a thought off the top of my head with you know we're talking about sticking with the three at the back with, with the win backs against maybe lesser opposition at home and, and expecting not to be as defensive i'm not saying we should drop Cash and target, especially cash, because he's been brilliant this season. But is there a, a, an option there as well? I know we're all saying, "Oh, you got to get Bailey in there, got to get Brendia." So you got to go for the back to play wingers to get them in. Can Bailey and Brendia play as wing backs? Well, Smith did it against Everton, didn't he? Just threw Bailey in threw there. Bailey on, yeah. Did. yeah, I don't think he'd do it. I don't think he'd start the game. Is it? I'm not sure. It'd be brave if he did, and I'd probably quite mm. enjoy it. But um, I think Brendia definitely could. I think when he was. At Norwich, he was leading the team in pressures and tackles and stuff, so he's got no problem tracking back. And I think he does it well. Like he's shown it when things aren't going his way going forward. He's still got the work rate going back and stuff. But yeah, if I think against teams like that, we'll operate for a system like we did against like the second half against Watford and like uh, Newcastle, just the four-three-three, and maybe drop Ings or Watkins and go with it from there and play Bailey and Wendia. Just make sure they track back as much as possible. Try all yeah. as well as another option. But yeah, it's probably worth maybe not playing Danny Ings every single game as well. Maybe giving him a rest every now and again because of, I think he has had knee problems and stuff like big knee injuries. Mm. So if you can give him like a rest or something, then it's only going to help you in the back end of the season. I've just got a tiny little preview of that predicted 11. I'm going to flash it up. I'm going full Pep Guardiola here. If you've got Bailey and Brendier as those wing backs and you push them further forward, Louise drops down as your almost second centre back and Mings yeah. goes out to the left and Conte goes back to the right and you almost got a makeshift back four. The the outside centre back push out to a full back position and Bailey and Brendier push right up as your wing backs. I'm getting way ahead of myself here and that'd be so attacking to have Bailey, Brendier, Watkins and Ings all playing in a front four. The options are there now that we're not just going, yeah, 4 3 every game and pass it out to the left wing and yeah. let Jack Grealish try and win the game. Because, yeah. yeah, that works to a certain extent, but to push on to that next level, we've got to be more tactically flexible than that and the squad that we're building allows us to do that. And as well, you can play that 4 triple 2 like Southampton did for the last couple of years as well, where Danny Ings would play with a Trey Adams and... Ollie Watkins is probably like a perfect foil in that sense because Chadams is so hardworking and uh, other strikers that Ings has played with um, as well. So it's almost like an upgrade of a Che Adams for Danny Ings. And then obviously on the wings instead of a, instead of like a McGregor or not McGregor, I forget who Southampton play with on the flanks, Redmond and um, oh, Scottish. Yeah, Arms. Yeah, Arms. yeah, yeah. Almost you've got like two different sort of um, more trickier wingers in Leon Bailey and Amy Buendir, if that's something that Smith would look at as well. It's, you know, I think whatever system you play, you've, you've got creativity and pace and a real goal for it in abundance. You know, whether mm. whether Bailey's on the bench, Buendir on the bench, Ings on the bench, you know, you've got proper options there. So it's almost like a, a known position for us Villa fans to be in, to think, oh, we can't have these really good players on the bench and not play them. But in reality, you know, look at the starting eleven; it's good enough already. Um, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with having a good bench and bringing those players on. We'll call it a day there for this podcast. We've had a few technical hitches, so hopefully I've been able to edit my way through this okay and no one's noticed. Um, we'll do a post... No, we won't. We'll do a... It's all going so well. We'll do a, a preview for Spurs on Friday, I think, or, or potentially Thursday, um, and, and talk through them and, and look through their strengths and weaknesses. Um, thanks, John and Pat, for your time this morning. Do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Get involved in the YouTube comments, get involved in the, in the debates, iTunes reviews, all that kind of stuff. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. See you again on Friday and uh, yeah, up the villa. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa. Up the villa.